asked to do a lot of things here. So we are asked to find f come f. We are asked to find f come g. We are asked to find g come g and g come f and all their domain. This will take half an hour. So we're going to pick and choose. We're going to pick and choose. So and their domains. Okay, so let's choose one and its domain. I recommend f come g, I agree, and, uh, and its domain. Okay, perfect. So by definition, f come g is f of g of x. We know this from a previous course, right? Good. So now don't cross it out like that. I, again, I'm just trying to make a point. So I have f applied to x squared minus 4x. And all I have to do now is just replace in f its variable by this. So this will be 1 over the square root of x squared minus 4x. And that is done. Now you can say, let's find the domain of this function. We can't determine the domain of the function composition by looking or analyzing the, uh, the outcome. It's not allowed. I'll explain in a minute why. Now, these problems, in my opinion, should not be in this chapter. The reason why I think that these problems should not be in this chapter is because we have not seen the range, the graph of these functions, this one, yes, but we haven't really seen the graph of this. And you can say, so what? Well, the answer is, I need the range. Because remember what I said, the first function has domain and then range, and then the second function has domain and then range. So I need not the range of the second one, I don't care about that, but I need the domain and range of the first function and at least the domain of the second function. So I think that these types of problems should have come into play a little bit later in the semester, not here in chapter two. But anyway, so let's work with this. Because it's f come g, which function do I apply first to x? Which function, which function do I apply first to x? Exactly. This is what it's called the inner function. The one that is closest to x is always applied first. As you see, if the function f is applied to a number, which is the second function, well, this is normally called the outer function. So the inner function is g of x, the outer function is f. So then, one more time, what do I apply to x first? Yes, I have to, always. I get g of x. And now we know that what I apply to g of x is? Yes. I apply f to get f of g of x. So this whole an analysis that I we are doing here is only for the domain of the function composition f come g. So all this discussion now, where I'm done with the function, I determine the function. But all this discussion now is because I need to answer this question. What is the domain of this? And I cannot establish the domain based on, like we can, for other functions. For the function composition, I can't do that. Okay, so first then I have to analyze g. Okay, so let's look at g. Again, we haven't discussed this as part of the previous course, but we haven't really graphed this. So I have to graph it with you because we have to determine its range, right? So this function <clears throat> is definitely a quadratic function. Does it open upward or downward? Does it have a minimum or a maximum? Minimum, because the leading coefficient is 1. Awesome. The leading, that's, so that's why leading coefficient is important. Arranging in a descending order is important. So it's quadratic, opening upward, with a leading coefficient of 1. It crosses, obviously, at 0 and at 4, right? When you set this equal to 0, you have x equals 0 and x equals 4. So this is the graph.
Now the question is, what is the minimum? Anyone remembers how to determine the minimum of a quadratic function? Anyone? From the previous course, anyone? Do we remember how to find the minimum or the maximum of a quadratic function? OK, let's write this. So max or min of a quadratic for a quadratic function is given by the vertex negative b over 2a and f of negative b over 2a. So our quadratic function, this is good, this is part of chapter 3, but we need to work on this right now. So g of x, x squared minus 4x, so then negative b over 2a will be, can anyone dictate? What is b? Careful. Perfect. Over 2 times a. Good. So the answer here is, careful, I see two negatives. Good. So then this number is 2. So now I plug it in, right? I plug it in to get the y coordinate. So let's plug it in. 2 times 2 is 4, 4 minus 8. f of 2 is 4 minus 8, which is? Very good. So now, so if this is 2, in order to determine this value, I have to find f of 2. 2 squared is 4, minus 4 times 2, which is 8. 4 minus 8, negative 4. So then the vertex is 2, comma, negative 4. Is that OK? So this point is 2, comma, negative 4. It's a good review. So we can go faster in chapter 3. I'm going to go through the steps again, okay. no matter what. Good. So now, having all this done, I can come back to our bubbles. And can anyone give us the domain of G? What type of function is G? Good. Polynomial, in other words. What is the domain of any polynomial function on the planet? Of course. Good. Now I have its range. Can anyone give us the range of G? So this is a domain, and this is a range. That's why we determine the vertex for the range. Exactly. Very good. Finally, this set is also what? It is the range of G but it's also the, exactly, it has to be the domain of f. So now I don't have to analyze the range of f. It's a second function. I don't care about its range, but I do care about the domain. So let's look at f of x now. 1 over the square root of x. How do I find the domain of this function? What do I have to write and solve? How did we find the domain of a square root? What did we write? What has to be? You said has to be. I didn't catch the first part. Maybe I, you said it, but I. When you say it has to be, did you say? No. Right. As long as it's not in the denominator. So then, since it is, 
Exactly. Exactly. Is that clear, Paul? OK, perfect. So then I come back and I say this is also the domain of f, which is, one more time, yes, 0 to infinity. And we have a problem. Where is the problem? The problem is that if the range of g is smaller than 0 to infinity, I'm fine. But what happens here is g will bring values that I cannot apply f to. Which values I cannot apply f to? First of all, 0. And everything to this, the left-hand side of 0 is not acceptable. So g is applied to some numbers and makes negative 4, or brings negative 4 here, but f cannot be applied to negative 4. Brings negative 3.2, but f cannot be applied to negative 3.2. Uh, brings negative 1, but f cannot be applied to negative 1. Brings 0, but f cannot be applied to 0. So what happens is I have to write negative 4, comma 0 must be excluded from the range of from the range of of course comma therefore I must find the values of x that make g of x be between This is what this is my target. This is what I need need to exclude from the range. Negative four to zero. And do what with those numbers after I find what they are? Remove them from the domain of the domain of exactly. That's the problem. I apply G to blah blah blah. And it gives me negative 4 to 0. In order to remove negative 4 to 0, I have to remove those values of x from the domain of g that bring negative 4, 0 in the second set. And that will become the domain of the function composition. No, I, I have to write it to explain what I'm doing. <laughs> Can we use the we refuse to solve for this? Uh, no, I will not put a problem like this on the test. But you have to see it. It's quite involving. Not difficult. If you think about it, it makes sense. But it's a lot of work behind the scene. I had to find the domain. I had to find the range. I had to graph. I had to see where it's happening. I had to realize that these have to be removed. In, removed. If I have to remove these, then I have to remove something from the domain. Clean up the domain. So now, and continue, and remove them, those x values, from the domain of g of x. That domain cleaned up without those values of x that make g of x be between negative 4 and 0 becomes the domain of the function composition. That's set. Okay? So now g of x is x squared minus 4x. This is not an easy situation.
However, we have the graph. Which x, x values make g between negative 4 and 0? Below the x axis. Yes. Which x values will make g to be between negative 4 and 0? Exactly. So that's what I have to remove from this. Okay. Yes. As you see, the function g is between negative 4 and 0 here, between negative 4 and 0. But those are the x values between 0 and 4. The x values between 0 and 4 make the range, make, the, make g be between 0 and negative 4, or between negative 4 and 0. So once I exclude these two, everything else is safe. So all I have to do now and say is, is say from here, I will have to remove 0 to 4 including 0 and including 4, because I have the equal symbol. So from negative infinity to infinity, remove 0 to 4. So the domain of f come g is negative infinity to 0, union 4 to infinity. Yes, it took me seven minutes because I need to explain. But no, I'm not going to put this on a test. But I want you to see one. It may be an extra credit problem to choose from or something, but um, does it make any sense? Yeah. Which part? So you understand the, the problem here is that G, Nico, G brings the, these values. But then I have to apply F to these values, but I can't. Not to all of them. Because the domain of G is 0 to infinity. I cannot apply F to values between negative 4 and 0. If G would bring here only 0 to infinity, the whole thing is fine. And this is the domain of the function composition. But there are some values that G is applied to and returns negative 4 to 0. Those values cannot be here. Every time I will have g applied to 1, the answer will be between negative 4 and 0, and I cannot apply f to it. So in order to remove negative 4 to 0, I had to remove from here 0 to 4. And now any value applied to negative infinity to 0 union 4 to infinity will never return negative 4 to 0, will only return 0 to infinity. And now the chain is never broken. But I had to remove, I had to massage this one. And I massaged it by removing 0 to 4. And we can work on another problem some other time if you want. We can choose anything else. Okay, so um, the um, final um, uh, section here is inverse functions and one-to-one -one functions. Inverse functions and one-to-one -one functions. Now, if you remember, we looked at two different situations in which two bubbles or two pairs of bubbles represented functions, right? Here was one, case number one, and this was case number two. Any number you want in there. And we said that one has a special property that the other one does not. This one has the property that if I want to go backwards, this is a function. This one does not have that property. If I want to go backwards, this is not a function. So this, exactly. So this one says to each y, it corresponds only one x. 
to each y only one x. But this one doesn't say that. It says, I found an, an, a y value that does not correspond to only one x value. So although they are both functions, this is a one-to-one -one function, and this is not one-to-one. -one. So now we can conclude only one-to-one -one functions have inverse this one has an inverse, but you already told me it's not a function. So only one-to-one -one functions have inverse function or functions. So if a function is not one-to-one, -one, it has an inverse, but that's not a function and we're not really interested in it. Now, this is extremely important about two functions. If this is one to one, and I apply f and I get y. The inverse function, the notation, is f inverse. Not to be read f raised to negative one, which means one over f. No, no, no. This is just a notation. So we read it f inverse. So if this is set A and this is set B, and let's say this is a mathematical way of writing domain and range. F colon, this means is defined on set A taking values in set B, which in other words, this is the shortcut. F is defined on A, A being the domain, taking its values in B, B being the range. So this is domain. And this is the range. Although we don't know anything about the inverse function, can anyone give us the domain and range of the inverse function? Absolutely. That's the definition. f takes x to y, f inverse takes y back to x. That's why you call it the, we call it the inverse. So now, if I say, uh, let's say, um, 1 corresponds to 5. If I ask you f of 1 is how much? Five. Good. And now if I ask you f inverse of 5, what would you say for sure? One. 1. So they are, the coordinates are completely reversed. So if I have 1, 5, then I have 5, 1. That creates something very interesting about the graph of the inverse function and the function itself. Let's say, and we're go going to discuss this function a lot in chapter 4. Let's say I have this function. This is function f. And I'm going to just make up some points here because I don't know the values I'm gonna say a comma B this is one I do know I'm gonna say 0 comma 1 this one I don't know I'm gonna say C comma D can you please give me three ordered pairs that will help me graph the inverse function of course of course so exactly so the key is, and I'm going to write the note for you in a second. By the way, which line is this? We looked at it last time. What function is it? The simplest possible function, base function. Very good. Very important function. So all the other points will be symmetric with respect to this line. So the answer is that the graph of f and f inverse are, and I'm not talking about odd or even, the graph of f and f inverse are what? 
symmetric with respect to the line, that's it. No, it has nothing to do with the function being odd or even. This is not an even function. This is not an odd function. So we're not talking about that, not to be confused with the idea of odd and even. So here's our note. Why does this happen? Because the ordered pairs for the e inverse function are reversed. So if I have 0, 1 here, then I have to have 1, 0 here. If I have uh, 2, comma 4 here, then I have to have 4, comma 2 here. So this distance between this point and this point is bisected. This line segment is bisected y equals x. This piece equals this piece. So note the graphs of f of x and its inverse are symmetric with respect to uh, the line y equals x. And this happens for any function. The graphs of f and f inverse are only symmetric with respect to y equals x. Any questions? Any questions? Property of inverse functions. Before we do that, I want to come back to this graph. How do I know? Forget about the inverse function for a moment. I'm given this green graph. How will I know whether it's one to one? Because I'm talking about an inverse. And you can say, wait a minute, you haven't prove that the green graph is one-to-one. -one. You're talking about the inverse, but there is no inverse for a function that is not one-to-one. -one. How do I know whether the green graph is represents a function that is one-to-one? -one? By the, say it again? Horizontal. That's it. By the horizontal line test, by the horizontal line test, this f is 1 to 1. Why, what does that mean? For every y value, there is only one x value. By the horizontal line test, for each y value, there is only one x value. Therefore, the green graph or function f has an inverse function. And uh, then when we graph them, the graphs of f and f inverse are symmetric with respect to the line y equals x. Now, here's a question for you. If I say f of x equals 2x, do you think that this is the inverse function? So multiplication by 2 and division by 2, will they be inverses of each other? So let's, let's think about the following example. Um, you have $10. And I say, I'm going to multiply your 10 by 2. So how much do you have now? But then I say, you know what? The $20 divided by 2. So are they multiplication by 2 and division by 2? Are they inverses of each other? Yes. You still have the same thing you had before. Now I'm saying to you, you have $10 divided by 2. And then I'm going to say, now multiply by 2. What happened? I applied two procedures to your x, to your $10. But at the end of the day, nothing happened. So they must cancel their effect on x. One cancels the other in any direction, right? So if I apply multiplication and then immediately division, Nothing happened by 2. I'm only talking about 2. Now multiplication by 2 and then division by 3, that's a different story, right? Or I can say, you have $10, here's 5. I'm adding 5. But then 3 minutes later, I say, give me my 5 back. Is adding 5 and subtracting 5, are they, I should say, two operations that are inverses of each other? Yes. 
this. I'm not talking about opposite numbers or a multiplicative inverse. I'm talking about inverse operations. Yes. Nothing happened to x. So multiplication by 2 and division by 2 are inverse operations. Uh, if I say square and then I ask you to take the square root, are they inverses of each other? Right. Okay. So here's a question then. Assuming now that I will create this. And I will create this. This is what we just created. Because you agreed with me that multiplication by 2 and division by 2 are inverses of each other. So multiplying by 2 after I divided by 2, or divided by 2, dividing by 2 after I multiplied by 2, what happened to x? Nothing happened to x. So then if these two are inverses of each other and they are applied in any sequence, what should the answer be? That's it. This is the property of inverse functions. If the two functions are not inverses of each other, you are not going to get x. You may get x squared plus 2, you may get x five plus 5, you may get x divided by 3, who knows. But if two, these two are inverses of each other, you will always get x when you apply them. I'm adding 5, subtracting 5. I'm multiplying by 2, I'm dividing by 2. Nothing happened. Is that clear? Okay. We're going to have an example in a minute on that. So let's take a look. And then I'm going to show you how to find the inverse uh, function. Use the inverse function property. I like it. I like to call it the property of inverse functions. They, they call it the inverse function property, the same thing, to show that f and g are inverses of each other. So let's start with a simple example like 28 on page 205. Uh, we are given f of x equals 3 minus x over 4, and g of x is 3 minus 4x. I'm asked to show that these two are inverses of each other. But I'm specifically told you must use this property. Okay, so what do I have to calculate? What do you think I should calculate and check whether I get what? Exactly. So what do I calculate then? Exactly. Awesome. And if the answer is x in both directions, what will I conclude about f and g? They must be inverses of each other. Because they cancel their effect. I applied them in, in two directions. First one and then the other and then vice versa. And I got x, plain x. They must be inverses of each other. There is no other way. If two functions are not inverses of each other, the function composition will not be x. Good. So then f of g of x, which is f of 3 minus 4x. And now remember, from the beginning of the semester, we said, I know how to read a function. I know. The function says 3 minus blah over 4. Now blah is 3 minus 4x. So then 3 minus parentheses. 3 minus 4x divided by 4. Take it slowly, distribute. So we have 3 minus 3 plus 4x divided by 4. I have to combine like terms first. These two go away. Then I'm down to 4x over 4. And the answer is? That's it. If this way is x, the opposite way will be x, but we still have to show it. So I already know that they are inverses of each other. So the other one is g comp f, which is g of f of x, which is g of 3 minus x over 4. I look at g now. Now I read g. g says 3 minus 4 times blah. So this is 3 
minus 4 multiplied by 3 minus x over 4. Is this clear? Are you with me? Everyone? Awesome. So then remember to simplify first. I simplify by 4. And now remember there is a minus in front. So this is 3 minus 3 but plus x. Minus 3 but plus x. So the answer is what do we conclude about f and g? Inverses of each other. f of x and g of x are inverses of each other. Because we got this. So now if you want, you can say, oh, then this is f inverse. Or you can say, oh, this must be g inverse. You don't have to, but I'm just saying you can. Final thing here is um, how to find the inverse of a function that is one to one. So for now, you have to trust me because we haven't graphed this function. You have to trust me that it is one to one. We can graph it right away with the graphing calculator, but we will graph it in chapter three. We will graph this extensively by hand in chapter three. So for now, trust me that this function is one to one. I'm asked to find f inverse. This is a four step procedure. Four step. Four, four step procedure for finding the inverse of a function. Step number one. One. At every step of the way, I will ask you can I do this? Can I do this? You know, you already know my habits. So uh, replace f of x with y. Can I do this? Yeah. Why? Of course. So y equals x minus 1 over 3x plus 4. It's good to get into the habit of asking themselves yourselves this when you do a problem. Can I do this? Is this okay? I'm not asking you to doubt yourself. I'm trying. I'm trying to establish a habit and trying to implement um, a, a certain thinking procedure when you work on problems. Okay. Again, if you have a better game plan, forget about mine. Okay. So next step, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to ask you if I'm a, a, if you allow me to do that. Interchange x and y or swap x with y. And I'm going to ask you, can I do that? Yes. Before you answer, that's correct. I'm going to ask you also, since Stephen already said yes, and it's true, I'm going to ask you why. Because now this value represents what for this function? What will this value represent for this function? No longer y, but I'm applying it. I'm applying this to this. What do I apply a function to? To x values or to y values? Right. So this value that was y for f, it becomes x for f inverse. That's why I'm allowed to swap them. That's why I swap the coordinates to graph. If I have a comma b, then I graph b comma a for the inverse function. Because the y value for f becomes the x value for f inverse. Perfect. Oh, so I see you're with me. Perfect. Then next step will be x equals y minus 1 over 3y plus 4. In step number 3, solve for, and I wait for you to tell me what am I solving for. Exactly, because y will become what? 
Y will become what I'm looking for. Exactly. Y becomes F inverse. Good. What type of function is this? I'm sorry, take it back. What type of equation is this? Right. And it's an easy one. How do we call it? That's why I put over 1 so you know it rings a bell. How is it called? Pro. Pro. Proportion. Thank you. Very important keyword to remember. Because only in a proportion I can That's it. Only the proportion I can cross multiply. You can say, I don't really need that. I can multiply both sides by 3y plus 4. That's fine too. I accept that. Good. So then the left hand side is x parentheses 3y plus 4. The right hand side is y minus 1. Again, what am I solving for? Perfect. What should I do on the left hand side? Awesome. 3xy plus 4x equals y minus 1. Then. Yes? Not the one minus one. Yes. So 3xy minus y equals negative 4x minus 1. Now what? Again, let me ask you, what are we solving for? Okay, what should I do? I have two terms with y, I can never do that. Remember, in the back of your mind, two action words. What are they? Right. Exactly, thank you. Please write those two keywords on the next 10 pages so you don't forget. So what do we have in parentheses? Very good. Finally, I have y. Yes, you can pull out a negative 1. That would be nice. And then the numerator is? Yes? Very good. Awesome. And the denominator is? Excellent. Final step. Step number 4. Replace... What do you think? What with what? Y with? Y with? That's it. Replace Y with oops, F inverse, because that's what it is. 4x plus 1 over 3x minus 1. Now, to be 100% correct, I'd like to come back here for a second. To be 100% correct, when I give a function like this, I should write for it x not equal. Zero is possible. 3 times 0 plus 4 is 4. I can divide by 4. Very good. Negative 4 thirds is not possible. The denominator set equal to 0, move 4, divide by 3, right? That's how we get this. 3x plus 4 cannot equal 0. That's how we get this. 3x plus 4 cannot equal 0. We subtract 4, divide by 3. To be exact. And also here, when I finish this, I should write if, like before, what? x not equal... That's it. Correct. These two go together. When I give a function, I should say x cannot equal blah, blah, blah. And when I determine the function here, I should write f inverse exists only if x is not one third. Any questions? 
Any questions? So, yes. Yes. Awesome. I will determine f comp f inverse. What should I get? That's it. Very good point. Excellent. Yes. I'm looking at another problem, and then we'll look at modeling. So let's say on page 205. 